Uh, the original discovery back in 1969 was that the sicker a person was, the more ascorbic acid by mouth that they could take. And this was in the magnitude of like uh, the average person with a cast iron stomach who doesn't have any trouble taking ascorbic acid can take 10 to 15 to 20 grams per 24 hours divided up into four to six doses before it produces diarrhea. Uh, now, this is, whenever I'm talking oral doses, I'm talking about ascorbic acid, and whenever I'm talking about intravenous, that I'm talking about sodium ascorbate. And uh, we'll refer to the mineral ascorbates, but they're not what I've, uh, what I've been talking about, and I find that I just don't get what I call the ascorbate effect. Now, the thing is, though, so this, this is the diarrhea produced, say, at 15 grams uh, when a person is perfectly well. With just a mild cold, they may go up to 30 to 60 grams in here. With a severe cold, maybe 100 grams. With influenza, 150 grams. And mononucleosis, sometimes in excess of 200 grams per 24 hours. I mean, clearly something was happening that I didn't learn in medical school. Uh, now, subsequently, we've come to the conclusion that what happens is that the free radicals generated by these disease destroy the uh, ascorbate, and the ascor while the ascorbate is destroying the free radicals. By the way, part of my jargon here is that um, I realize vitamin C and ascorbate are the same thing, but when I say ascorbate, I mean when I'm using it for the electrons carried, not for the vitamin C. And when I say vitamin C, I mean the tiny amount that you need for vitamins. And I want to make this very clear, that the reason for these enormous doses is not for the vitamin C particularly. It's for the electrons or the reducing equivalents carried by the vitamin C. I think that part of the problem, or the major problem, uh, when we get sick, whenever we get an inflammation in a tissue, is that the mitochondria have been so damaged that they cannot keep up refueling the free radical scavengers. You know, there are two types of free radical scavengers. There are the enzymatic free radical scavengers like catalase that will destroy uh, peroxide and it just sits there and does its thing over and over again without the input of energy. Uh, but then there are free radicals like the hydroxyl free radical rancid fats and so forth that do not have a specific enzymatic free radical scavenger and have to have a non-enzymatic free radical scavenger, which is an electron donor, uh, to neutralize it. And so uh, once a non-enzymatic free radical scavenger like vitamin C gives up its two extra electrons, it's useless until it gets refueled by the mitochondria. And this is a very dynamic process. And what this titrating to bowel tolerance revealed that this was of a magnitude which was just totally unsuspected. In fact, I find that some of the very sophisticated literature on free radicals these days, they don't seem to have a clue as to the magnitude of the free radicals. I mean, can you imagine how many free radicals are uh, causing this increased tolerance from, say, 15 grams to over 200 grams when you have mononucleosis? And uh, that's a lot of extra electrons. See, what happens is that ascorbate is very stable in solutions now, now, or in the, in the body uh, and breaks down only to dehydroascorbate at first through the ascorbate free radical. But the point is that dehydroascorbate is very unstable, and if it's not re-reduced back to ascorbate very rapidly, it's irreversibly lost. So that if you have in a tissue, you, if the mitochondria can't re-reduce the dehydroascorbate back to ascorbate almost instantly, then all of this ascorbate-dehydroascorbate redox couple is lost in the tissue, and you have this condition I call acute induced scurvy. Uh, this doesn't mean that you have scurvy all over the body, but you do have uh, scurvy in the tissues involved in the inflammation. So that one of the things that we get with the moderately high doses is that we reverse the acute induced scurvy. But, and this is the reason why, say, children with a chronic otitis media may be treated with antibiotics and have their ears drained and go on and be sick for long, long periods of time. Uh, and then you give them massive doses of ascorbate, uh, then they suddenly get well. And, and the reason is 
that <coughs> the white cell, it's a non-controversial fact that white cells need a little bit of vitamin C for phagocytosis. And, and, and when they have this condition of acute induced scurvy in the depths of these infected parts, then the white cells are pretty powerless to, to destroy anything. The only thing that really saves us is uh, that antibodies build up. It's interesting that white cells are incapacitated by the lack of ascorbate. I think antibodies uh, are actually activated. There are studies which indicate, and I'll go into this a little bit more later, uh, antibodies, the affinity of antibodies for their antigen increases in an oxidative redox potential, which for the lay people here means that the tendency for the antibodies to grab hold of their antigen, whatever it is, is increased when there are a lot of free radicals around. Uh, so that the way we treat patients mostly is with oral ascorbic acid and you do what I call titrate to bowel tolerance. Now I start people out on ascorbic acid powder because ascorbic acid powder uh, in mixed in water and carefully sort of try to keep it off your teeth as much as possible uh, has a very rapid onset which you can feel in your head and this is sort of like how do I know when you're hungry I don't know you know and so I teach a process whereby the person the, the patient themselves determines the amount of ascorbic acid they need the other advantage uh, of the powder is that when you overshoot and get diarrhea it's not going to last as long imagine the situation that if you started getting diarrhea and had 30 grams of tablets as yet undissolved inside yourself you'd be in big trouble for a few hours so the powder is rapid in rapid out now as soon as I or as soon as the patient determines uh, the dose that they need to take under the certain circumstances uh, then I switch them over to the tablets uh, I really like the tablets a little bit more. They're more convenient. You can carry them around in the pocket. I mean, I carry these around and take them all day long. Uh, you might say, well, gosh, that's dirty to, to have it in your pockets. I'll tell you, those of us who take ascorbate, the last thing that we worry about is common dirt. I think that this is why wild animals make ascorbate. Uh, when they eat all this dirty stuff off the ground, you know, you see what a cat or a dog or a rat or whatever eats off the ground. Uh, you wonder, why is it they don't get sick? Well... I think the reason is that they make ascorbate very rapidly and this neutralizes the toxins of all these dead and decaying foods. Uh, it's interesting that uh, all the other animals except for man, monkey, and guinea pig, uh, and there's an African fruit-eating bat, uh, don't make ascorbate. Um, and I've often said that if you can't give it to anything but man, monkey, or guinea pig, you try vitamin C on it and you're likely to cure it. Um, the guinea pig, I think, is an example. We, uh, monkeys are too expensive to, to use routinely in testing human diseases, so why do we pick on the poor guinea pig? Well, the guinea pig doesn't make ascorbate, and so you can give it human diseases. Uh, I have a, a friend, Wendell Belfield, down in San Jose, who's a veterinarian who has been curing uh, dogs of distemper and kennel fever for about 15 years with intravenous ascorbate. And it seems what happens here, see, picture that uh, if the disease is way out here, say it's a 300, 400 gram disease, uh, and that the dog is capable of, say, making this amount of ascorbate, that means he can't get any of these diseases back here. I mean, isn't it interesting how dogs don't catch colds? And people will, uh, or bacteriologists will say, well, they don't catch colds because colds are species specific. Well, you know, there are about 100 different viruses that cause colds in human beings, and there's not even one that causes a cold in a dog. Come on. So the thing is that dogs, wild animals don't get sick down here, you see, and, and so when they get sick, they're way up here. They're in big trouble. And uh, so anyway, but if they are up in here, you can give them intravenous ascorbate, carry them through for a few days, and drop the disease back down to this point, and then they're well. So... Anyway, this is what Belfield do, does. He's an orthomolecular um, veterinarian. Let's see. Uh, 